You're listening to the second season of the study podcast with Dr. Paul Wegner on Genesis. I'm your host, Tyler Sanders. Across from me is Dr. Paul Wegner, and he's going to give us our Hebrew words of the day. Yeah, today I've got a real special two times for you. (laughs) This one is interesting. Uh, In Genesis 23, 4, it says, I'm a stranger and a sojourner among among you. Give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. It's two Hebrew words put together. Hmm. The first, okay. and, and really they mean almost the same Stranger thing. Stranger and a sojourner is kind of one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so what, what's happened is that uh, ger can mean stranger and sojourner. Uh-huh. And actually um, the, the second word is probably more dweller, you know, because it's got the word yeshav in it to okay. seed or dwell. Yeah. And so, so I put them together and I tried to translate them close, but they've, uh, my NASB translated as a stranger and a sojourner. Yeah. But it was interesting that they're put together from a, with a, Macave to hold them together, okay, and then assumes it makes it sound like you're gonna you're gonna translate them together. Hmm. So it's interesting. Um, and I thought, well, uh, what I I got out of the information is that it's a sojourner living in a foreign land, okay, and, and they have no protected rights. Is what it sounds like. Okay, so that's going to be important when we get to Abraham because he yeah. says he's a stranger and a sojourner here. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see if we'll see how that works out. Okay. okay. So that's one of them. And then apparently a resident alien could live in Israel, graze their crops and herds on the land, but could not own it. Um, thus, they had no say in what, uh, what, oh, you know, what happened yeah. in the land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what's interesting. And that's, it seemed, what we wouldn't catch in the, huh. uh, the, the passage we're going to look at today is they are, they are trying to do everything to keep Abraham from uh, actually getting pl- a plot of land because right. then he has a say in what happens. Right. So I think that's interesting. Yeah. So, so yeah. We'll, we'll look at that later today. Okay. All right. Then in Genesis 23, 6, it says, Hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury mm-hmm. your dead in the choices of our graves. None of us will refuse you his grave for burying your dead. The word "mighty prince" is actually "prince of Yah- of God," basically oh, wow. of uh, uh, Elohim, oh. and it looks like what's going on is that. Uh, Elohim is used as a superlative. Uh-huh. There's several places where Elohim joined on a word or joined with a word to make it superlative. You know, the, mm, the greatest of all yeah, things. Yeah. So I think that's what's going on now. It, it could also be translated uh, "Prince of God among us," meaning, you know, we mm. know you're connected with God. Yeah. Except I don't think that's probably what they're getting at. And there's other places that suggest. That, that that Elohim can be used as a superlative. Hmm. So I think it really is here. Okay. Elohim, he, Elohim is sometimes used as a superlative, meaning anything connected with God is, you know, yeah, super bigger, great. Better, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's it. Okay. So those are my two for today, yeah. and both of them are going to affect our translation. And what are we what are we talking about today? What oh, passage are we? Hang on. To? Uh, let oh. me show you some of the other passages where oh, Elohim. Elohim. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's check so, that. Uh, so Rachel said, "With mighty wrestlings." And literally, wrestlings of God. I have ref- mm. wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed, or indeed prevailed. And she named him Naphtali, which is uh, wrestlings, is what that word mm. means. And then uh, thirty-five five, uh, they sojourned, and there was a great terror, and it, it, it literally is a terror of God. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Among yeah. the cities. Yeah. Okay. And then First Samuel fourteen uh, fifteen, and there was a trembling in the camp and field among uh, among all the people. Even the garrison and the raiders trembled, and the earth quaked so that it became a great trembling. Yeah. And that's a trembling of God again. Yeah. So, yeah. and then Psalm uh, uh, 80 verse 10 says, the mountains were covered with this, with its shadow and the cedars of God. Now this time it's interesting. Um, the NASB actually translated it, the cedars, the cedars of, God, of God, instead of the great cedars. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Huh. So it, it seems like they're not necessarily consistent, or maybe they understood this one slightly different than the others. Right. So I, I just thought that was helpful for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now we're into the text that the we passage. wanted to talk about. Yeah. yeah. So we've looked at things that are in the passage, but now let's look at the yeah. big, big picture. Yeah. All right. Uh, in, in Genesis 23, Sarah mm-hmm. dies. Okay. Yeah. Now, Sarah lived 127 years, and, and these were the years of the life of Sarah. Then Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. I've got a little map here to show you where Hebron is. Okay. Okay. Um, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Then Abraham rose from his dead 
and spoke to the sons of Heath, saying, um, I've got a little picture up here of a Rolling Stone tomb. Oh, yeah. Um, now, this would not be the same time as Abraham's, because uh-huh. this is this is um, anywhere from the first century BC to the first century AD, uh-huh. more, in, more of like what Jesus could have been yeah. put in. Yeah. Okay. But I wanted you to see um, there are about, I've, I found out there's about six of these. I only thought there was like four, but apparently there's there's more of these Rolling Stone tombs in Israel too. Oh, really? Yeah. So I thought it was interesting. All right. Wow. Okay. I'm a stranger and a sojourner. There's that that yep, play of words. Yeah. yeah. Among you, give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Now let me just stop there. If he doesn't have a burial site, that means he's got to carry Sarah with him. Mm. Right, he's got no other place to put it. Yeah. So what do you do? Yeah. Okay. So so that's why, and they know in one sense they've got him over a barrel. Right. Right. Okay. So all right, and the sons of Heath answered Abraham, saying uh, to him, "Hear us, my lord. You are a mighty prince. There's that prince of God among us. Mm-hmm. All right. Bury your dead in the choices of our graves. None of us will refuse his grave to bury your dead." So Abraham rose and bowed to the people of the land and the sons of Heth. And he spoke to them saying, if it is your wish to bury me and my dead out of my sight, hear me and approach Ephron, the son of Zohar for me. Now let's just stop a minute. So why, you know, it sounds like, what's wrong? It it sounds like they're giving him permission. Yeah, to go ahead and bury the dead. Well, here's the problem. Um, I think I've got a picture of it. Oh, I'll have a picture later. Let's keep going and I'll come back, okay? okay? Uh, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns, which is at the end of the field, for the full price. Let it, uh, let him give it to me in your presence for a burial site. Now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the sons of Heth. Even even of all who went in the gate of his cities, that that's actually helping us to know these were the leaders because they're oh, sitting yeah. at the gate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, saying, "Oh no, no, my lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the." cave that is in it. In the presence of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. That really sounds like he's giving it to yeah, them. for free. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and Abraham bowed before the people of the land and he, as he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, if you will only uh, please listen to me, I will give you the pr- uh, price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. Uh, then Ephron answered uh, Abraham, saying to him, my Lord, listen to me, a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. I just need to let you know at that point, 400 shekels of silver is an outrageous price. Yeah. And I'll show you in a minute. That, uh, what is that between uh, me and you? So bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron uh, the silver, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth. 400 shekels of silver, commercial standard. Wow. Uh, one more. Um, so Ephron's field, which was in Machpelah, which faced Mamre, uh, the field and cave, which is in it, and all the trees which were in the field uh, and uh, that were there, uh, that, that were within all the confines of the border, were deeded over to him. I, I just thought you should know, that's how they did it back then. They mm-hmm. they own every, all the, even counted trees, because trees were valuable. Sure, yeah. So they put that in the deed uh, to Abraham for a possession, uh, for a possession for the presence of the sons of Heth. Uh, before all who went in uh, at the gate of his city. All right, now here's here's a picture of where probably the cave of Machpelah is hmm. uh, in Israel today. And this is the shrine or the, it's, yeah, it's a, I'd call it a shrine around it. Okay. Yeah, I've been to it once and it was real hard to get to because you had to go through guards and all of that mm. to get there. Yeah, it's in, um, it's in the West Bank part. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Here's here's what I, I, I want you to know about a family tomb. Okay. And this is an older one. This is not the same time period. But but what would happen is when they bring them in, they put the newest body right next to the door there, and there would be mm. um, you know, a slab. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the garden tomb, but there's a slab yeah. there. They'd put the newest body there as it deteriorated. Mm. Then after about a year, they'd take the bones and usually put them in a niche. This doesn't, doesn't have niches. Um, but that's why Abraham is not too keen on saying, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll put Sarah in your grave. Because what right. happens in a year, they put her in a niche, and before long, they don't know her bones from right. Anyone grandma's bones. 
Jones right. and stuff like that. So that would, in one sense, that means that she would be gone yeah. in, in their mind. So so Abraham's not willing to just yeah. put her bones in somebody else's grave. He wants his own. So that does help, actually help us know what's going on there. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right. So that's the first thing. Um, without a grave, Abraham will have to carry Sarah with him. And that's mm-hmm. that, that'd be despicable, right? Yeah. The smell and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Abraham is a gear, a resi- resident alien with no land uh, and it has no say in what happens. And they're trying to keep it that way. That's why he gives him, you know, he says, you know, uh, the next thing is really funny because they, they make it sound like, oh, you're a great prince among us. Yeah. Take any of our land. We'd be honored to do that. But what they're basically saying is, we will, we don't want to give you any land, so we'll, we, we understand you're between a rock yeah. and a hard place. We'll let you use it. Yeah, basically is what they're kind saying. Kind of no restrictions. You can yeah. use whatever you need. Which, but... which is kind of what they were allowing them to do with their yeah. flocks and herds, Yeah, which is kind of funny. You know, we wouldn't think you could do that, but... In, right, right. In this time period, that was fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then the Hethites did not want to sell him land, um, but they also don't want to offend him. That's why they're using that polite terms and yeah. all that. And then 400 shekels is a lot for one cave, right. hoping he would not accept it. Yeah. You know, who in their right mind is going to pay 400 shekels for a, a cave and a little land? But he and, did it. Yeah. He had and, it. And that's because he's got more money than he's got land right now. Well, well yeah. And that <laughs> yeah. probably explains also why they don't want to offend him too. Yeah. I mean, he obviously did have, Yeah, you know, he's wealthy and probably had a lot yeah. of power. And stuff. I don't know if you remember, but just a little before this, he got a thousand shekels from Sarah, for oh, Sarah, right, right from right. Avimelech. Yeah. So, yeah. so he, he has plenty of money. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Payment for a land, uh, the threshing floor and the oxen, uh, David got him for 50 shekels of silver hmm. in Second Samuel, 600 shekels of gold by weight of a, for a whole site. I don't know if you know where Samaria, uh, Samaria up in the north. Oh, yeah. They get the whole, the whole hill of Samaria for that price. Wow. Yeah. And then 17 shekels of silver during Jeremiah's time for um, his relative's plot of land, whatever it was. Yeah. So so nothing is anywhere near 400 yeah. shekels. And this is earlier right. uh, than these ones even. Yeah. So we know it's an outrageous It's an exorbitant price. price. Yeah. yeah. But Abraham's willing to pay it because yeah. he's, he, what else does he do? Yeah. yeah. Well, and then also he owns yeah. the Plenty. land, which is also, yeah. gives him influence. And that's going to be the only plot of land that the Israelites own in that time mm. period. Yeah. Wow. So you remember God had promised the land yeah. to Abraham, but this is the only one he's going to part he's really going to own. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. All right. Okay, that was that was one thing that I thought if you just read that, you there's a lot of stuff you'd miss. Yeah. So I thought it'd be helpful to to point out some of these things. Yeah. All right, I got one more. Okay. Okay, the other one is talking about a bride for Isaac. Remember the next oh. chapter in yeah. chapter 24? Yeah. Okay. Um so let's go to that one. Now, Abraham was old, advanced in age, and, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned. Uh, let me just stop there. Um, do you see what he says? Um, uh, he was old, advanced in age. Now, yeah. he, he actually lives at least 25 years longer. Hmm. So it's, I think what it means is he's thinking about his death and and what's going to happen. And we do know uh, slightly later, you know, well, it's not on this one, but yeah. um, he, we do know he's getting up in age, but, yeah, yeah. but it's not like he's decrepit and he's falling apart. It's, yeah, yeah. it's like he's thinking about what's the next step and he's got to get a, a wife for Isaac. So that's yeah. the next thing he has to do. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then it says the, his oldest, uh, his servant, which is the oldest in his household. We know who that is. I'll bet that's Eliezer of Damascus. Oh yeah. Yeah. They that, mentioned him earlier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would have thought now uh, that it, you know, if I was Eliezer of Damascus and I thought I was going to get the whole inheritance and then Isaac comes, now he loses that whole right. inheritance. I would have thought, Hmm, I'm a little angry. Why don't I give him a real jerk of a wife? That'll pay him back. Right. He doesn't do that at all. He's right. actually so. In fact, we'll, I want you to see this. He goes overboard to get the right wife for right. us. Right. So it's really kind of interesting. Okay. He says, "Place your hand under my thigh." I'm assuming that that is very literal, and it actually means that that's you know the thigh was thought to be the uh, part of the, their body that carried on their inheritance. Hmm. So I'm assuming that that's why it was there because it was a sacred spot for carrying on your line. Oh, interesting. And so I think that's why it was that did that. Yeah. yeah. 
and I will make you swear by the Lord. I'm going to just stop there. Other people have thought that refers to other things. And I, I other not, things, <laughs> like, yeah, like, um, because it has to do with his paternity, his oh, carrying on. So other, I see what you're saying. Yeah, other yeah. objects. I'll yeah, just yeah. leave it there. Gotcha. Yeah. I still think it's probably thigh because throughout scripture, thigh seems to be the term used mm. for their uh, carrying on their inheritance. Interesting. So yeah. Huh. Okay. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of earth, that you will not take a wife from my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you shall go to my country and to my relatives and take my wife from uh, for my uh, wife, for my son Isaac, mm-hmm. um, this was Abraham's responsibility. He was yeah. the one that had to get the bride for the uh, his son, uh, and it appears to be Eliezer Damascus. And I put it, this could have been a good payback time, yeah. but it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> Hand under the thigh is uh, probably an oath for carrying on his line. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go to the next thing. And the servant said to him, suppose the woman would not be willing to follow me to the, this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Then Abraham said, uh, th- then Abraham said to him, beware lest you take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth and who spoke to me and who swore to me saying, to your descendants, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and will, uh, and you will take a wife for my son from it, from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, uh, follow you, then you will be free from my oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham and his master and swore to him concerning this matter. Um, the question: if, I have two questions here. So. Why does he not want his son to go back there? And I think it's because, remember, God had already given this land to Abraham and he promised him that. So if he takes him away, then it probably wouldn't be his land anymore. Right. right. So Abraham makes it very clear, no, it's it's off if he goes. But I want to know, why does he want a wife from his his family? Because think about it. Abraham's living among the Canaanites. They're yeah. pagans, right? Yeah. They serve Baal. Okay, I understand. You don't want somebody from them. Yeah. You go back up north. His his family followed Uriah, the moon god. Right. They're pagans too. Yeah. So why? What makes, What's the what, benefit? Yeah. What difference does it make whether you take them from the north or from the right. south? They're both pagans. Yeah. But there is, I think, something really important. What we need to know is that the people in the land usually worshipped the god of that area. So when this lady goes from uh, where Abraham's family is down to Israel, she already knows she's got to give up her family, the gods. And so the idea of leaving that makes perfect sense. Where the Canaanites, yeah. they wouldn't have to because they're living in that land yeah. already. Yeah. So so there's actually a really logical reason why okay. he says, go back there and yeah. get one from there. I can buy that, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think it makes some sense. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then the servant took 10 camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of goods of his masters in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I'm standing uh, by the spring and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Well, first I want to tell you about camels. A camel can carry up to 400 pounds, and he's got 10 of them. Yeah. Ah, even, you know, even if, if I don't know how many people were going with them, you know, Abraham, yeah, sure, I'm, yeah. I'm sure he took some servants with him yeah. so that he could go yeah. take care of himself. Um, but I'm going, 10 cap. that, that maybe is one camel. Maybe, right. you know, so what's all the other camels for? I think it's to wow the family. Yeah. Because remember, they've got to be willing to give up their daughter yeah. to a guy who they haven't seen for years. Right. How do we know if he's even alive and yeah. if anything's happened to him? If he comes with all this wealth, then it automatically says, oh, he can probably take care of her. Right. So I think it's interesting. He's smart enough to know that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then he went to the well to find young girls. That's like going to the mall on Friday night. <laughs> He went to the very place where he knew all the girls, you know, the younger women would all go draw water. Mm. And he knew that. So it was a perfect place to go. And I thought, well, that was that was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Then he tells God where he is. I thought that was funny. If, if this God is the God of the heavens and the earth, then he yeah, has to he tell him where know, he right, is. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that's kind of cute. All right. Okay. There's our camel. And yeah. he can carry up to 400 pounds. 
<laughs> All right. Okay. Now, it may be that the girl who, whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, drink, and I will, give you, I will water the camels also, may she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that, I have show, that you, you have shown kindness to my master. And it came about before he finished speaking that, behold, Re- Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with a jar on her shoulder. And the girl was very beautiful a virgin and no man had relations with her. And, and she went out uh, down to the spring and filled the jar and came up. A couple of things. Now the, the, the reader knows that this is the, from the correct family, yeah. but the Sir Eliezer still doesn't know that. Oh, that's true. Yeah. 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 So he, he would know, still yeah. know that. I think what's interesting also is notice it calls her a virgin, but then it says no man had had relations with her. And I'm going, well, isn't that saying the same thing? Yeah. And in actual fact, it probably is. Hebrew has no problem uh, re-emphasizing mm. stuff. So I think that's what's happening there. Um, yeah. And I don't think it's that the word virgin doesn't mean virgin at that time. Mm. I think it's because it's, you know, it's making sure you know that's what repetition. Should. And, it, and when it says no man had relations with her, that probably even means that she's not betrothed because that oh, would be yeah, important yeah. too. You know, yeah. so even if it's not relations like, you know, physical, yeah, yeah. it could be that he had, she was promised to somebody. Yeah, committed. And that, so that could mean that also. And I think then yeah. it would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Still not done yet. <laughs> and it came about when the camels had finished drinking that a, a man, uh, the man took a, a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets on her wrist weighing 10 shekels of gold. Now, that's a that's really good payment for yeah. watering the camels. Yeah. Um, the gold ring is probably a, a nose ring because later on mm. it actually tells you that. Mm. Um, but at this point, 10 shekels of gold. Now, a shekel is about 11 ounces. So okay. so it's it's not an outrageous weight, but it is a good uh, hefty uh, bangle yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So that's a good weight. Yeah. Okay. And said, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? And she said to him, I'm a daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. Perfect. That's what he needs, right? Yeah. All right. And again, he sa- uh, she said to him, we have plenty of straw and feed and, and room to lodge in. Then the man bowed and worshiped the Lord. And he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. As far um, a- and as for me, the Lord has guided me to the way of the house of my master's brothers. So she, he's making it real clear that God had led him, and, and now he knows yeah. it, okay? Yeah. All right. Um, now, Rebecca, oh, you know what? Um, I skipped a part. Um, I forgot to ask you, do you know how much a camel can drink? No. About 40 gallons. That's can a, hold that a, much, Yeah, I assume if they're on empty. But right, yeah. yeah, I never know. But, um, yeah. but 40 gallons of water. And now she's she's got a jug. There's probably clay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can't be any bigger than, I would think, three gallons, because yeah. that would be really hard to yeah, carry. Yeah, too heavy, yeah. So can you imagine? And, and it says that the the, the uh, uh, trough or whatever was a little ways away from the well. Yeah. And that would be smart, because you don't want the animals walking in, yeah. the, on the, in the spring water. Yeah. So that means that that girl is a really, really hard worker. Yeah. And I'm thinking that's another thing that that servant knew is he said, you know. Well, and he asked specifically for that, like, yeah. I'll kind of ask for water. Yeah. And if she offers to uh, water the camels, essentially. Yeah. And, 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 and now that would be a big job. And, and now you know it's a big job. Yeah. Now, he did pay her pretty well, but yeah, yeah. I think that was just, I think now he's trying to woo her, right? Because yeah. it's more than the payment would be worth, but he's trying to woo her. But he, what I wanted to emphasize is, man, he knew, he was perfect at knowing yeah. what kind of wife should, should Isaac have. Right. A good hard worker. She's beautiful. Yeah. She's of the right family. What more could he ask? Yeah. So I yeah. just thought that was interesting. Yeah. Okay. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to the man at the well. And it came about that when he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's r- wrist, and when he saw, heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, saying, this is what the man said to me, he went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. And he said, come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside since I've prepared the house and a place for the camels? That, that almost makes it sound like, you know, like, well, why you're standing outside, but, but it's, it's to let him know that I've already prepared the place for you. So mm. I want you to come. Yeah. So it's, it's making sure he knew that. So the man entered the house 
And Laban uh, unloaded the camels and gave straw to, and feed to the camels and watered, uh, water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. All right. Uh, notice it says brother comes in and stays, stays with them. Um, I want to point that out later also, but it is interesting that it, it keeps saying his brother. Yeah. Okay. Hang on. We're, we're going to look at the next one. Um, uh, he, he basically, the, the, they go in and eat and then they tell the story again. Yeah. So I thought you don't need to hear it twice. Yeah. All right. So now if you're going to deal kindly with me, so he actually makes it, he says yeah, that he's here to, um, find a wife for Isaac. Yeah. And, and so that's what he's talking about. Okay. Uh, tell me, and if not, let me know that I may turn to the right or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, so that's Laban, the brother yeah. and Bethuel, the father. Yeah. But it seems, hang on, it was, look, and answered and said, the matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. And the servant brought, uh, brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Okay. But not her father. Yeah. See, I'm actually thinking that the, when it says Laban and Bethuel, he's making a decision for the family. And when Laban is making it, he's also doing it for the father who I think has oh. already died. So I actually think that's the only time you ever hear of Bethuel. Yeah. Uh, it could even be around. But I think that's just saying um, this decision is coming from both from, of us. Yeah, right. And, and I have it's the, the authority, authority of the father, yeah. essentially. Yeah. All right. So I thought that was interesting because otherwise he didn't give her uh, you know, any money to him, right? which seems odd. Yeah. All right. Okay. So brother makes the marriage arra- rela- uh, arrangements if the father is dead. Later, she's asked if she wants to leave immediately or go uh, or, or not, and she goes. Yeah. But notice, she's not asked if she wants to marry him. Sure, yeah. That, that, was, that was the decision of the brother. Right. Okay? Right. So the only decision she has is, well, do you want to go now or do you want to wait 10 right. days? <laughs> right. And actually, remember, uh, the servant is actually, I, I, I really like this Eliezer of Damascus, because he also um, says, you know, with all these stuff that I've got of my masters, you know, 10 camel loads of wealth. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's going to be probably a 30-day trip to get there however long it takes to find a wife, and then 30 days back. Yeah. So if he waits too long, I could see why his fa- uh, you know, Abraham would be worried about uh, all the wealth oh, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. So this, this uh, Eliezer says, you know, I, I, I don't want to stay around here, and even 10 days would make that a, a, you yeah. know, cause my master to fear. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is get right out of here and get back. Yeah. And so I, I actually really like that guy. He's, yeah. he, he does an excellent job of finding a wife even at a time when I thought he didn't need to. Sure, yeah. And then, and then he does a brilliant how to, to um, you know, to make sure that Abraham wasn't worried about. He definitely the, kind of fulfills Abraham's oh, needs, like big time. Perfectly, like he, he really. Yeah. He goes above and beyond. Yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see the conclusions. Okay. Okay, it's part of Abraham's job as a father mm-hmm. to get. Uh, a wife or a husband for yeah. a wife for Isaac. A wife for Isaac, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then Abraham's servant got a wife for Isaac, uh, and it's probably Eliezer of Damascus mm-hmm. from back in Genesis 15. The camels can carry about 400 pounds apiece, and there's 10 of them, so that's a lot, um, intended to wow Rebecca's family, I think, yeah. which would do that. Yeah. Um, why did he get a wife from Abraham's family? Moon worshipers, and my response is, they knew they were going to have to give up their God when they moved to a different geographical area. Yeah. And so that was a given for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then a wife servant got the perfect wife for Isaac. And I think over and over you saw that through that passage. Yeah. So I think that's kind of amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Now I've got a little more for us. Okay. All right. Uh, Rebecca was barren. So, so in chapter 25, Rebecca comes and remember she's barren. Um, right. and, and that's interesting. Abraham's wife was barren. Yeah. Uh, Isaac's wife is barren. Um, so it's actually interesting. I've, I've often th- thought it was something in the water because both of them come up from that same area. Right. And right. when they get away from it, they now could have children. Yeah. So uh, probably not, but I just wondered. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So she's going to have two sons. God's going to open her womb. Okay. Mm-hmm. Esau is the first one. Esau, uh, um, 
Edom comes from that. He's said to be red all over. Hmm. And, and so it's a, like a play on his name. Yeah. All right. And he's a hunter. And then Jacob is the one who, uh, uh, who takes by the heel. That's that what Jacob means, almost like heel grabber or yeah. supplanter or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it says that he's a complete person. And, and it's real hard to know what Tamim in that, or a Tom in that area, what's it talking about? Yeah. I assume it means more well-rounded. So he he could, not only could cook, um, but he probably could hunt and take care of the animals and stuff I like see. that. Yeah, so yeah. It, it sounds like he's more well-rounded than just a hunter. I see. So that's the only thing I can think of that maybe it means. It's a weird way to talk about him. Yeah. Okay. And remember when he's, when he's she's having these children, um, they're... They're like fighting inside yeah, of her right, and she right. wonders what's going on. And yeah. God tells her there's two nations inside of you. Yeah. Okay. And then Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a meal. I wanted to talk a little more about that. So let's look at this passage. Yeah. All right. So in verse 20, it says, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padamaram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Boy, that really is explaining who she is, right? Yeah. And Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled within her. And she said, if this is so, why is this? Why then am I this way? And she went to the inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated separated from your body. The one people sh shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Hmm. That's So uh, even, even before he's born, he yeah. knows that God has chosen the uh, Jacob and not Esau. Yeah. So um, that's going to cause a little problem later on. Yeah. yeah. And when her days uh, to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment. That is really funny because later on, he remember to make it yeah. to, to make uh, Jacob look like Esau, he has puts yeah, uh, like, like yeah, yeah yeah like a lamb's uh, right. skin on him yeah so he was really hairy yeah all right um, okay uh, and they named him Esau which is uh, probably red uh -huh. all right and after his brother came forth with his hand holding on to his uh, Esau's heel his name was called Jacob and heel grabber or something like that. And Jacob was 60 years old when the, when she gave birth to them. Then the boys grew uh, up. Uh, Esau was a skillful hunter and a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man or perfect man or well-rounded man mm. uh, living in tents. Mm. So I'm not exactly sure what that peaceful man is, but yeah. you know, it's. I think it means well-rounded and yeah. more. Anyway, um, now Esau loved, or Jacob, uh, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but mm. Rebecca loved Jacob. So that's going to cause problems yeah. all, all the way through our story. And Jacob had cooked uh, stew. Esau came in from the field and was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I'm famished. Uh, therefore, his name is called Edom. <laughs> it was red stuff also. Uh, but Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. So what use of, is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. Now, a couple things in the story. He's yeah. been out hunting. Yeah. Obviously, he's not fa famished enough that he's going to die, right? Right. He just didn't want to... You know, he probably had uh, the animal, but it takes... You know, can take hours oh, to sure, get an yeah, animal yeah. ready and then cook yeah. the food and all. So I think he's... He just wanted it right away, yeah. okay? Um, and then uh, Jacob wa wants it. Now, the, the birthright has two responsibilities. Okay. Um, first of all, the firstborn is honored. Like in Genesis 49.3, uh, Reuben, you are the firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and pre uh, preeminent uh, in power. So the firstborn was thought to be the first one that comes out of your body and it has the most strength and all that. Mm. That's what was apparently thought at that time. So you've got a certain amount of honor there. Yeah. Okay. Um, sanct uh, in Exodus, it says, sanctify to me, uh, every firstborn, for the firstborn of every womb among the sons of Israel, both man and beast, it belongs to me. Remember when they came out of Egypt, um, all the firstborn had died yeah. except for the Israelites. Yeah. And now he's, I think what God is saying is, I spared them then, so why don't you give them to me now? Yeah. Okay? Because they would have been dead otherwise. Yeah. Um, also what God was doing, and this is brilliant, if you've got the firstborn, you've got the one carrying on the lines, and yeah, if yeah. that one belongs to God, 
basically it's going to pass all that down to all yeah. the other offsprings because they're connected to, to this yeah. Yahweh God. Yeah. So it was a brilliant move on God's yeah. part too. And then in Deuteronomy 12, 3, it says, and there, shall, uh, and there you shall bring for your burnt offerings, your sacrifice, your tithe, the tribute of your hand, uh, hand your votive offerings, your fill, free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flocks. So it was often, that was the one that God requested. Uh, des uh, yeah, desired, wanted, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've often, we'll look at this later, but I've often thought that if it's the first one coming out and, and it's given almost in faith, because if you don't have oh, any sure. more, yeah. What's then you've next? basically yeah. given him everything. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's an element of faith in there, even. Yeah. All right. Um, firstborn rights. Deuteronomy twenty one uh, seventeen says, "But you shall not acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. To him belongs the right of the firstborn." So again, you got the beginning of his strength, the yeah. idea there, but then also a double portion. Now yeah. that sounds great. But remember, he has to take care of the, the women in the family with that. Right. So it's the double portion meant that he's the one responsible now for keeping the family going and yeah. taking care of all the women in the family. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. So that means he has responsibilities. So if he's sure, got to yeah. take care of all the women in the family, Isaac seems like, or I mean, um, uh, Esau seems like responsibility is not one of his big mm. uh, uh, character traits. Yeah. And I think Jacob, it was, he wanted that. I'm, just, I'm really surprised that Esau wouldn't want that because if if you knew right. that that God had passed down the Abrahamic blessing through the yeah. oldest person, yeah. you would expect you'd want that. Right. And Esau doesn't seem to care. Yeah. So I think at this point, you see there's some responsibilities, but there's also some honor that goes with it. Yeah. He probably wanted the honor, but didn't necessarily want the responsibilities. Well, and they say at the end of that passage we just read that he despised yeah. his... Yeah. That kind of... Yeah, it tells you. Yeah, it makes a little more sense, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, here's the conclusions for this. Abraham was a resident alien, so this is for the whole thing. Yeah. Um, he could use the land, but could not own it. Abraham pays an outrageous price for the land. I, yeah. I, I was amazed that he would be willing to do it, yeah. but he's over a barrel. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. he's carrying Sarah with him. Yeah. So it makes sense. The cave becomes Abraham's family tomb, and even later, they keep coming back to it and putting people in it. Mm. So that's, that's important. Yeah. Um, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, uh, the servant got the perfect wife for Isaac, and I thought that was brilliant, how he did it, and yeah. going to the right place, and then asking God, and all of God worked it all out. Yeah. So it was a brilliant response, I thought. Yeah. And then Esau sells his birthright. Uh, it had honor, rights, and responsibilities associated with it. And I think Esau just didn't want all that, yeah. but he was willing to, to uh, sell it to... Uh, and we do know of other people buying it. In the ancient Near East, there's a... Hmm. a uh, buying a, birthrights? Yeah, there's a deed that we know of that uh, one of them bought it for two lambs. Wow. So, so it was a, it was something you could buy, quantify and, it, and sell it. Actually, yeah. Wow. So it's interesting. Yeah. So those are the the, the reason I pulled those ones together is because I thought these are things that by reading it you may not be able to catch from the yeah, and and by knowing the culture and some of the things that are background, it really helps you. Yeah, I mean, especially uh, probably of those three, the. Uh, story of Jacob and Esau is probably most familiar to people, yeah. but it is a little bit confounding. It's not super... Yeah. It, I, I think a surface reading can make Jacob look cruel yeah. or something. Like, why wouldn't he just... Yeah. He has the food ready. Like, why wouldn't he just give it to... You know, there's these things that yeah. kind of aren't totally yeah. totally clear, but I think, I think that reading of it does make it... Um, a lot more kind of reasonable in a yeah. way. It clears it up. And then I, I thought for the sons of Heth, it, they make it sound like they're honoring Abraham, right, but right. it's almost like a fighting match there. They don't want to give any land up. But yeah. then when he when he finally says 400 shekels of silver, my guess is he thought Abraham's not going to pay that. And then Abraham does, and he, there's he's yeah. what can he do? Yeah. He can, and then but uh, Ephraim can't or or. Um, yeah, I think it's, I know it's, what is it, Ephron, can't yeah. go back and say, oh, I, yeah, I'm actually, at 500 sh right. shekels. <laughs> right. to, yeah. But once again, Abraham, I think, needed to pay it either, anyway. 
Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And it ended up, it ended up being a good yeah. purchase down the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I suppose today it's worth a lot of money. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole shrine around yeah. there. <laughs> oh, well, those are the things that I, I wanted to pull together today. Yeah. And, and I think next week, remember, he's got the birthright now. Yeah. He's going to get the blessing next. Oh, good. Okay. So I wanted to explain what that blessing is, but yeah. I thought it was a little too much for this time. Well, I'm looking forward to next week. I think All it's right. going to be a good one. Oh, good. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.